be, about not knowing exactly what's going on and to have that kind of fear. So we'll pray for Denise. And I got a text from uh, Tim Roberts that Pam is not feeling well tonight. And we will pray for her. Who else has prayer requests? Mm. Okay. Okay, we'll pray for him. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, let's pray for her. Lois. Let's pray for Lois. Anybody else? Okay, let's go to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we come before you tonight, God, to bring these requests. We're so grateful, Lord, that we can call upon your name and that you're always, always, always attentive and listening and active on our behalf. So tonight, God, we, we pray for Lois and we pray for Pam, and we pray for Denise, and we pray for uh, Jason and Rachel's mechanic, that all of these people need healing in their bodies. They need you to intervene in their situation, God, that your faithfulness would be so evident, and that your power, Lord, the, the power of healing that we believe so strongly in would be evident upon each one of these people in a very personal way, that you will just work in an extraordinary way in their lives. We thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to look into your word tonight. We have been into the Beatitudes, and we're going to finish that tonight. And Jesus, I just thank you for the Beatitudes, and I thank you for all that we have learned. And I pray that we're putting that into practice in our own lives. I pray, Lord, you'll give us just a, a great learning opportunity tonight, and that when we leave this place, we will just leave so much enriched by the word. I pray, Lord, for those that are weary tonight, that there's something about the presence of God and, and being together in fellowship that just energizes them so that when we leave, we can say it was good to be in the house of God together. Amen. Amen. Well, this is it. We're going to finish the Beatitudes tonight. So, uh, so Jenny, thanks for coming for the last one. <laughs> Blessed are the persecuted. That's, <laughs> that's the one we're on tonight. So how appropriate is that? <laughs> so... And this, I really, really enjoyed studying, praying through, researching, working on all this entire series. What we've discovered is this. Let me just give you the background one more time. That Jesus had been traveling for about six months all over this region around the Sea of Galilee. And he's traveling everywhere he goes. He's done a lot of healing. But he's also found a people that as a whole are very beat up. They are, they are just beat down and beat up. And, and they're beat down by the Roman government, that about 90% of the people are hovering at the poverty rate, and that life is just survival. It's just constant survival. Where's my next meal going to come from? How am I going to take care of myself? It's just, anybody who's ever had financial pressure, that's exhausting. It is exhausting to have that kind of constant, constant stress. On top of that, Judaism has been taken over by religious leaders, legalists, Pharisees, Sadducees, legalists, who have also made serving God almost impossible. That There's all these hoops that they're constantly trying to jump through to make sure that they're pleasing God. They're really not pleasing God. They're trying to please and appease the religious leaders. And, and so, because as we've learned, there's not another street, church down the street. There's one synagogue in every town. Sometimes not in a town, they had to go to, if it was a small town, they had to go to a local town. So being a part of the synagogue was very, very important. So after this six months or so of traveling, Jesus ends up back at home around Capernaum where he's staying. And he asks the twelve to join him. They go up on the mountain and he's going to teach them. But word spreads that Jesus is there, so a very massive crowd also follows and he gives to them what we have come to call the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Very extensive, longest, uh, probably most comprehensive teaching of Jesus that we have. 
And over the last couple of months, we've been working our way through these one at a time. And what we've discovered is that even though these are short, pithy little statements, that there's so much there. And we have uncovered meaning below the surface. We have uncovered that in the depth of the Greek language and in what first century hearers would have heard, we've discovered that there's so much richness here. And so tonight we come to the eighth and final one, which is not very short. It's, a little, it's probably the longest of them all. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Uh, Matthew, yeah, verse 10. Blessed are those who've been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And what we have discovered, and I don't know how meaningful it has been to you, but what we have discovered is that blessed is a challenging Greek word. It is it is. There, there's not a real good English equivalent. And, and so that most translations say blessed. Some translations say happy. But we have discovered that a word that I have really latched on to and really like is the word flourishing. That, that people who do these things flourish. They, they thrive. They blossom. They just do really, really well. And that Jesus is saying that. Jesus is affirming that people who have tapped into this kind of living... This kind of approach to life, to have this kind of perspective, that they tend to rise above their circumstances. That their circumstances are not driving them, but that they are constantly adapting to their circumstances. And so we come to this last one. Blessed or flourishing are those who are persecuted. That sounds really odd, doesn't it? <laughs> right? But we've discovered that so often that these there seems to be this contradictoriness about these things. Flourishing or blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. And yet what we've discovered is that once we unpack these words and really understand what the first century was hearing, then we have this great value, this extraordinary value. I've really tried to put us into the first century. And so what we've done every week, we're going to do tonight. We're going to take this apart a little bit, and then we're going to put it all about together. Because who is Jesus talking about? Who are the persecuted? And, and, and what did Jesus mean by being persecuted? And how does that apply to us? And why would anybody persecute people who are poor in spirit and who are mourning and who are meek and gentle? Why would anybody persecute those kind of people? You know, that, that, that just seems insane. But it all goes back to what Jesus meant. And so what I want to do is I just want to do a really quick review because, we're, again, we're just pulling, putting a bow in all this and wrapping it all up. But I want you to see the progression. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And what we learned in that is that, in essence, that people who are desperate for God find God. And people that find God will flourish. They, they will do well. It doesn't mean that they don't have adversity. It doesn't mean they don't have challenges. It just means that they have tapped into God as a source, as their strength as the God who's going to comfort and be with them. And then blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And what we discovered, what Jesus was saying is by mourning, was that, is that people, who, people who go through difficulty, who can find meaning in their difficulty, who can find purpose in their difficulty, those are the people who flourish. The people who find God will find meaning for their life. Blessed are those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And what we found out about that was is that when we lean into God and we find meaning in life, we enjoy life a lot more. If we can find God and find the purpose in whatever we're going through, then life takes on a greater satisfaction. There, there's a greater joy about life. Then blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. The people that want to be right with God, that long to be right with God, that are not satisfied with serving God on the fringe or the perimeter, but people that want to be fully into the center of God and knowing God and loving God and serving God, that those people are going to be right in every area of their life. 
And then blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That what we learn by that is that when we do good for others, when we help others, when we give toward others, when we're generous toward others, that it will come back to us. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see. God is that people who have a pure heart will see the activity and presence of God. They, they will see God is at work, and they will see how God is working. And then finally, blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the sons of God. What we found out is that being a peacemaker is not being a peacekeeper. It's a loving truth teller. And that sometimes, before things get better, they get worse. Because you're trying to love somebody into a better place. But that we are most like God. To be a son of God, the word son to the, Jew, to the Jewish people means to have the character, have the nature. So people who are peacekeepers have and are showing the very nature of God. So now we come to this one. Blessed are those who have been persecuted. So, why? I start off with this question. Why would anybody want to persecute people who are living like this? And I'll tell you why. Because one reason is, is that this kind of life is in stark contrast to any other way. It's in stark contrast to people who don't know God. It is in stark contrast to people who are playing games with God. It's in stark contrast that, that people who live like this, their life does go better. They have a richer life. And that oftentimes people, it's an interesting thing because there, because there are people out there, they don't want God, they don't want any part of God, but they still can get jealous of what we have in our decision to serve God. And that they can persecute us from that. That's why this is so offensive, is that, it's, it's that, it's that people, unhappy and miserable people tend to want everybody else to be unhappy and miserable, <laughs> you know? And so when you are thriving, flourishing, blessed, happy, doing well, you are reminding them, you, you, and you're, without even saying anything, you're, the quality of your life is reminding them that they are unhappy and miserable often by their own choice, but unwilling to do anything different to change that. So, but in particular, Jesus says this, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. It's not persecuted just for anything. It's persecuted for a very specific thing. In fact, we're going to dig into this just a little bit more. But in 1 Peter chapter 4, we have these words. If you must suffer, however, it must not be for murder or stealing or making trouble or prying into other people's affairs. That, that's the kind of persecution, you kind of brought that on yourself, you know? It's not that. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by His name. So what Jesus is saying back in the, in, in the, in the uh, Beatitude is what He's saying is, you're, you, uh, he's not talking about you, if, you're, if you're bad and you're persecuted for being bad, if you go steal something and you're arrested, that's not persecution. <laughs> you kind of brought that on yourself, you know. But if you are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, and if you remember with me the word righteousness, a very practical definition that I have used for a very long time, is that righteousness is being so right with God vertically that it affects everything horizontally in my life, especially my relationships. Righteousness to me, I get this. I didn't get, uh, I, I, I've, I've read a lot of theological definitions, and, and I just like it where I can get it. And that makes sense to me. Righteousness, being so right with God that it affects everything in my life. That's what Jesus says. Blessed are you if you are so right with Him that it's affecting everything in your life. But that you may find yourself persecuted. And I think not only is Jesus talking about this particular thing, blessed are you, uh, bless our, bless our, for being persecuted for righteousness sake. But I think there's a very specific kind of righteousness that he's talking about. And here's what I think he's talking about. Is that you and I are, we are commissioned. We are called to go and spread the gospel. We are called by God, all of us, to be witnesses. 
And that's where the persecution comes. It's not just that you've accepted God and you're living a godly life and you're living a moral life. It is when you and I try to go and take the gospel to somebody else. When we try to be that witness, when we try to bring people over to our side of the party, when we try to help them cross into the line, wherever that might be, with family, with friends, with coworkers, with, with people that we just meet on a regular basis, because any time that we're going to be a witness, there are times that we have to lovingly confront somebody about their sinfulness, about their lifestyle, and that is often where we meet resistance. That's where the persecution comes in, and they push back for a lot of reasons. They push back because they're ashamed. They push back because they're embarrassed. Sometimes people push back because they're convicted, <laughs> but that's what Jesus is talking about, that those who have been persecuted we think of persecuted, Kim and I were even talking about this, when we think of that word, we instantly think of like martyrs, like, you know, people that are being drugged out of their houses and stoned, and, and, and that certainly is an ultimate sense. But we can also be persecuted other ways. In fact, there are four ways in this verse, in these two verses that we can be persecuted. We can be persecuted when people insult you. When people insult you. This word, insult, is a great word. It was, it was used by the Greeks to refer to a, a wild animal that was snarling and growling, that, 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 that it's baring its teeth at you. It, it, it was assuming an attack mode. And that there are people that when you try to take the love of God, you try to tell a family member about Jesus and what he's done, or you're trying to tell a co-worker, you're trying to tell somebody, you're trying to do that, what you may meet is insults. They may call you goody two-shoes. Or they may look for that, because we all are imperfect, no matter how perfect we're trying to be, we're still imperfect. And so they may say, they may find that one little thing about you that is not there and call you a hypocrite. Or they may call you a legalist. Don't put your, you know... One of the big phrases that we hear all the time in our culture is, don't judge me. And yet, we're not, there is a point where people are called to account for their, to be responsible for themselves. And so, if you remember Sunday morning, I talked about Galatians 5.15, that they bite and they devour and they consume. This is, a, this is one way we can be persecuted by people around us. That, that they just they want to insult us. They just want to they want to call us names and they want to pick on us and they, they want you know to cause um, difficulty in our life. The second word is the word persecute. And this is a great word. It literally means to hunt something down aggressively, like you're on the hunt for something. Aggressively hunting, like a hunter who's aggressively, uh, dogmatically. Uh, viciously going after somebody. And in the Greek, the Greeks understood this word to also mean somebody who is picking a fight, who is intentionally arguing, who is, who is um, harassing you. There are people out there, they are just combative. They just want to, they don't want, they don't want the gospel. They just want to argue. Oh my goodness. You, that's a kind of persecution. When somebody just wants to, you know, harass you. But just because you serve the Lord, there are people who want to harass you for that and argue with you about that and, and, and fight about that, you know? When they falsely talk about you, and that word falsely means that they are, they tell half-truths. They, they, um, they create suspicion. They raise questions about your character. They speak lies or rumor or gossip. You know, some people... Some, you, you've been around somebody, and somebody will uh, have an opinion about somebody else, and, and they may not directly attack you, but they will say things that plant seeds of doubt. <laughs> That's a kind of persecution. People are like, really? And then finally, all kinds of evil against you. That word evil means that they have an absolute malicious intent to destroy your character, to tear you down. Legally, we would call this libel or slander. But these are four things that Jesus says that when we are trying to help the gospel go forward into the lives of others, that we may be retaliated against. We may be insulted. We may have people 
argue and fight and be pugilistic and combative. We may find that there are people who will lie about us and spread rumors about us or question our character, our integrity, or to drag our names through the mud. And Jesus says these people to whom this happened, they flourish because they don't get into that. They don't get drug into the mud. They don't fall into the fray of this. That they flourish because in spite of these attacks, they just, they just don't get down at that level. That they, 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 they just stay high. They stay high. There, there was uh, Michelle Obama said a, a great statement. When they go low, we go high. There's people that go low all the time. And sometimes in our humanity, we just want to roll up our sleeves and get into it with them, right? <laughs> and Jesus says, blessed are you, flourishing are you when you resist that. When you don't do that. When you don't call somebody a name who's called you a name. When you don't bully somebody who's bullied you. When you don't harass somebody who's harassing you. When you don't drag somebody else's name in the mud just because they drug your name in the mud. They flourish because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And what we learned about that phrase, kingdom of heaven, because that's the very first one, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What we discovered was Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience. And the, the Jews held the name of God with such awe and reverence, they didn't even speak the name of God. Yahweh, they would write down the letters, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. And they barely ever spoke that name because it was so sacred. So what we found out was that, is, is that heaven is a synonym for God. And that because Matthew is writing to Jewish people, he doesn't want to offend them, so he uses a synonym, the heaven of God, heaven, or that it's the kingdom of heaven, which literally also can mean it's the kingdom of God. And what we discovered is that it means the rule of God in us. It means the work of the Holy Spirit in us. It means the activity of God working inside us, strengthening us, helping us, giving us life, encouraging us. And I wish, uh, uh, and I hope, as we go through this Sunday morning, as we work our way through the fruit of the Spirit, this week we're going to have the fruit of the Spirit is joy. As we work through that, I hope what we discover is, you know, there, there's so much God wants to do in us, and there's so often that we leave God out of the equation, and we just try to do it ourselves. We try to do it in our strength. We try to buck it up, you know. And I got to be joyful and I got to be loving. And we looked at all that Sunday about, you know, what does love look like? Four ways. And, and we talked about all that. But if we could just really tap into this. And this is what, this is what James is talking about. And this is what Jesus is talking about. Is that the kingdom of heaven is not out there. The kingdom of heaven is in here. The kingdom of God is in here. And the kingdom of God is the rule of God. It is the presence and power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Us Leaning into God and allowing the Spirit of the Lord to do that. Here's a really important question. Who's doing the persecuting? Who's doing this insulting? And who's doing this name calling? And who's doing this argument? Who's doing that? And I want to suggest to you at least three groups, probably more than that. But one is unbelieving family and friends. Sometimes, how many of you know the hardest people you ever try to witness to is your own family. Right? I mean, they're tough. If you have unbelieving friends, that's tough. You know, if they you know if they want to if they want to get into apologetics and they want to debate, they, these are people that can persecute us. Carnal believers in the church, they will persecute us because they they are carnal. <laughs> and 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 I've seen this. You watch, you watch somebody. I've seen this many times. There'll be a group of people, because we all tend to gather around us people that are kind of like us, that, that we kind of have similar values. And even inside churches, churches do this. People kind of gravitate toward each other. And, and here's what, it, you, I've watched this happen so many times. You watch one person in this little group, especially if it's like, a, if it's a little group that, you know, they're, they're just kind of on the fringe, you know, they're in and out of church, and they do, you know, they, 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 they do they do things that are just very marginal all the time. One person gets convicted about that. 
One person gets convicted. And they start to rise up. And you know what everybody else is going to do? Try to drag them back down. It's like the old thing about, you know, crabs crawling out of a cage. That, that if you have one crab, if you have a group of crabs, that one crab starts crawling out of the cage, the other crabs pull it back down. That's what carnal Christians do. Carnal Christians, because if you get fired up and you start living better, that makes me look bad. And that makes me feel bad. And so carnal people will attack you. Carnal people will attack you and me in the church because they, and they will do it in all kinds of ways, but they do it because they don't want to change and they don't want you to change. They just want all of us to stay mediocre. Let's just all be in our little mire together and life's okay. Until, and it's all good until somebody breaks out. Finally, those who are just against the gospel. I'm not talking about just lost people who just don't know yet, but truly people that are absolutely against the gospel. They're going to insult and lie and accuse and say malicious things. That's what they're going to do. That's really hard. You know? So are we persecuted like somebody's hunting us down? No. But are we persecuted in ways where people will insult us or question us or try to raise, you know, call us hypocrites or find inconsistencies in our life? It's hard. And yet Jesus commends us. He says people that can know, people that are willing and want to take the gospel to others, people that want to make a difference in this world, people that want to give life to somebody else, these kind of people will flourish. They will be persecuted, but they will flourish. In fact, he says in verse 12, rejoice and be glad. I'm sorry. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. And I want to, we're going to finish really early, but that's all right. Um, I want to give you four ways that we are rewarded, because this is the good part. This is the meat. All this other part is like nobody wants to go all through all that, but we go through all that, but that's part of it. But here's the, here's the great part. Four parts to the reward. Number one, re- rejoice because you're in good company. You're in good company. Verse 12, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus is saying, if you're persecuted for being godly, for wanting to take the gospel into another person's life, to introduce them to a better way, to introduce them to salvation, you're in, even if they insult and attack and everything else, you're in good company because this is what they did to the prophets. And I told Kim, uh, Kim always hears my sermon more than once because I'm working through it all the time. So we, we went down to see Denise today. I was talking to her about that. And I said, you know, that one is kind of like, you know, okay, I'm in good company. That's not real, you know, it's like, okay, we're all being beat up together. That just doesn't feel real good. But here's the point. You're on the right side. We're on the right side. So if we are persecuted and insulted just because we're living the, the Christian life to its fullest and we're trying to take it to other people and introduce them and they push back on us, then Jesus said, be encouraged because this has always happened, but at least you're in good company. You're on the right side of the equation. Does that make sense? Now that, you know, that's not, I mean, it's encouraging. I, it's going to get better, <laughs> but at least we got that. Second of all, because these attacks are temporary. These attacks are temporary because here's what you can't see and here's what I can't see, but here's what is obvious in the Greek language. The English language is not like the Greek language, and it's not obvious, but if you, if you dig this out and go do your own research on it, these Greek words, persecuted, um, insulted, um, falsely lied about, all of those words in the Greek are in a tense that means It's short, it's limited, it doesn't last forever. It won't go on and on and on and on. It will come to a conclusion. Because usually, when these people see that they can't drag you into it with them, they will get bored with you and move on. (laughs) You know? The easiest way to take the fight out of a fight is don't fight. (laughs) So... So these kind of people, so again, this is not, I mean, everyone gets a little bit better, but here's something that you need to know. These attacks are temporary. They won't last forever. There will come a time where they'll just give up and go on or, you know, leave you alone or whatever. 
Now, the next two, though, really get good. The reward is because in some cases, your influence is going to make a difference. And this is where it gets powerful. Because when you're doing this, you are planting the seeds of the gospel. You're planting the gospel. You're planting the gospel. You're planting the gospel. And some of those people are going to resist. And some of those people are going to. But here's what's going to happen in some cases. The Holy Spirit is going to take those things and start convicting. And start working on somebody. And soon you may see them actually come to church. And kneel their life to Jesus Christ as Savior. And you had a part of that. And that's a reward. It's not what it took to get there. But it's when you got them there. So I told this story. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reaching a point where I just tell all my stories over and over. <laughs> it dawned on me the other day. That I have preached long enough now that if I would go back to all the way very back to the very beginning and preach every sermon one time, I'd be done. <laughs> I'd be retired. But I'm not going to do that to you because that's not who I am. But um, I, I, I was not a Christian at 19. And, and, and I had a good home life. And, and I'm very grateful for the home life I had. I had a, a mom who really, she, we had been out of church for years after my dad's suicide. And then my mom remarried, wonderful man, he's my dad, he adopted us, and they got back in church. And I, I, you know, I mean, it's my mom and dad. I love, love, love and respect my mom and dad. But I remember my mom would come to me and say, would you come to church with me? No, I don't want to go to church. Life is good. I don't want to go to church. Especially at Assembly of God Church. Because they're crazy people down there. Right? <laughs> so, yeah. And I never, ever argued with my mom or anything. But inside, I thought, why can't we just stay the way we were? It was working. Well, it wasn't, but it was. I had just felt a lot of inner turmoil. And my mom, my sweet little mom, she'd just come to me. She would just occasionally say, would you go to church with me today? No, Mom, I don't want to go to church. I'll go to lunch. <laughs> I won't go to church. And she just occasionally, she didn't wear me out. It wasn't like every Sunday, but every now and then. And one Sunday, she just said, would you go to church with me today? And I thought, you know what? If I just get this over with, if I just get up and get this over with, then I can say, been there, done that. Got up, went to church. You all know I got saved that day. My mom was planting seeds that even though inside I felt a lot of resistance to that, I didn't want that and felt... God was using those seeds that would become a tipping point to me becoming a believer. Take courage, take, take comfort in this. That, that if you have family members, or if you have friends, or if you have people that you're trying to win to the gospel, and, and, and they may not even be at the level of insulting and persecuting and arguing and all that, but inside you, if they're just resistant, just be, be encouraged that in some cases, your influence will make a difference. And in some cases, there's, there's going to be a tipping point. And, and they're going to cross the line of faith. I don't know about you, but that is greatly encouraging to me to just say, hang on. Hang on. And then finally, because you will be rewarded in heaven. You'll be rewarded in heaven. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10 says, Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. You'll have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful till the death, and I'll give you the crown of life. You're going to be rewarded in heaven for our witness, for our faithfulness, for our planting seeds, for our sharing the gospel. There's, there's going to be, there's going to be a, a reward in heaven. You know, it's possible that we have little little crowns in heaven. I don't know. But I think much more likely is crowns are symbols. And the crown of life is symbol. You know, when we talk about when you crown somebody, that is giving them honor. That is bestowing value. That is bestowing worth. That's acknowledging 
them, that, that, that's praising them for their exceptionalism. You know, it doesn't, we may not have literal crowns, but to be crowned with life means that you are acknowledged, you are honored for the good that you did, for living the life. You're honored for that. Like, like Proverbs chapter 17, verse 6 says, grandchildren are the crown of the aged. Well, I don't like that last word, but, <laughs> you know, you are what you are. What you are. <laughs> okay. Grandchildren are the crown. Well, they're not our little crown, but it's the honor. There's so, isn't it wonderful to be, if you're a grandparent, isn't there something wonderful about that you didn't kill your kids, you let them grow up, and now though, now you get to, you know, you get to be grandparent. You get to grandparent these little darlings. You get to watch your kids mess up, but then you get to watch your grandkids grow up. That there's something honorable about that. There's something, there's something worthy and valuable. So maybe the crown of life is the honor of having taken the higher road. And not getting into that. Maybe the crown of life is the validation that comes with and the acknowledgement that we rose above. Maybe the crown has something to do with something being praiseworthy. That that is, that is, uh, that is noteworthy. That is uh, praiseworthy in our life. So, here's what I think. That, that, that we're, one of the things we're going to hear God say, Jesus say, is well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. We're going to hear him say that. that. In a sense, that's a way of crowning somebody. You're affirming them. You're acknowledging them. Well done, good and faithful. And here's what I love about this, is that, that oh, I hope this communicates the way I wanted to get it across, is that whatever honor, whatever attribution, whatever is bestowed upon us, we're going to turn that into praise and cast it at the feet of Jesus. Does that communicate? Does that come across? Uh, that is why when you are persecuted, you flourish because you don't give up and you don't give in and you endure insults and arguments, and harassment, and rejection, and being lied about, and having your name go through the mud, having your, being called names, being bullied, all that. You flourish when you don't, when you take the gospel, but you don't get drug into that, knowing these four things, knowing these four things, that it's not going to last forever. That you're in good company. You're not the only one. You're not there by yourself. You're in great company. And that and that you're that the seeds that you plant, one day you may see that person walk across the line of faith. And that when we get to heaven, that Jesus himself is going to crown us with well done, good and faithful servant. And we're going to take that and turn it into praise to the Lord for what he did. Because he did it all anyway. And we were just vessels. That makes sense? Anyway, hope you've enjoyed our walk through the Beatitudes and that you've learned something. <laughs> you learned one thing tonight. <laughs> All right. Lord, we love you so much. Wow. It's, there's so much, so much. I, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for every one of these Beatitudes. I thank you, Lord, help us to flourish. Help us to flourish. Help us to, when, when, when family when carnal people, carnal believers, when, when people that are just absolutely against the gospel, when they insult us, when they argue with us, when they fight us, when they resist us, when they laugh at us, when they mock us, when they ridicule us, help us not to get down on that level, but help us when they go down, we go up, we rise above, we hold our head high, we trust in you, we plant seeds, we water them, and we watch you work. Lord Jesus, it, this is a timely word for all of us. I, it's certainly a timely word for me, Lord, to be reminded, because it is so easy to, to, it's easy in this culture that we live in to just build a wall around our life, and we're, that we, we're not going to get out there. We're not going to share the gospel, because our culture is turning more and more godless and anti-God. 
but help us to know, Lord, that part of our responsibility of being righteous people is taking the gospel to others. It is, it is, it is planting seeds of the gospel. It is sharing the love of Jesus with somebody else. And it is at times, in a loving, kind way, confronting someone on their sin and pointing to the fact that Jesus died for their sins and inviting them to cross that line. Help us all, Lord, to take this one and, and to live it out, tease it out, figure it out, unpack it for ourselves. And thank you, Lord, for all of the Beatitudes. May they all may help us to flourish. Help us to go back to our notes or go back online and listen to the messages over so that we all might flourish at a higher level. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Thank you for tolerating me and being here. I appreciate it very, very much. I know it's a burden. <laughs> Just imagine if you had to live with me. <laughs> See, there's always something to be grateful for. <laughs>